Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 199. Chapter 199. On the 17th of August, Rostov and Ilyin, accompanied by Lavrushka, who had just returned from captivity by an hussar orderly, left their quarters at Yankovo, 10 miles from Bogochevaro, and went for a ride to try a new horse Ilyin had brought and to find out whether there was any hay to be had in the villages. For the last three days, Bogachevaro had laid between the two hostile armies, so that it was as easy for the Russian rearguard to get to it as it was for the French vanguard. Rostov, as a careful squadron commander, wished to take such provisions as remained of Bogachevaro before the French could get them. Rostov and Ilyin were in the merriest of moods. On the way to Bogochevaro, a princely estate with a dwelling house and a farm where they hoped to find domestic serfs and pretty girls, they questioned Lavrushka about Napoleon and laughed at his stories and raced one another to try Ilyin's horse. Rostov had no idea that the village he was entering was the property of that very Bolkonsky who had been engaged to his sister. Rostov and Ilyin gave rein to their horses for a last race along the incline before reaching Bogochevaro, and Rostov, outstripping Ilyin, was the first to gallop into the village street. You're first, cried Ilyin, flushed. Yes, always first, both on the grassland and here, answered Rostov, stroking his heated Donetsk horse. And I'd have won on my Frenchie, Your Excellency, said Lavrushka from behind, alluding to his shabby cart horse, only I didn't wish to mortify you. They rode at a footpace to the barn, where a large crowd of peasants was standing. Some of the men bared their heads, Others stared at the new arrivals without doffing their caps. Two tall old peasants with wrinkled faces and scanty beards emerged from the tavern, smiling, staggering, and singing some incoherent song, and approached the officers. Fine fellows, said Rostov, laughing. Is there any hay here? And how like one another, said Ilyin. A most merry company, sang one of the peasants with a blissful smile. One of the men came out of the crowd and went up to Rostov. "'Who do you belong to?' he asked. "'The French,' replied Ilyin jestingly. "'And here is Napoleon himself.' And he pointed to the Rushka. "'Then you are Russians?' the peasant asked again. "'And is there a large force for you up here?' said another, a short man coming up. "'Very large,' answered Rostov. "'But why have you collected here?' he added. "'Is it a holiday?' The old men have come to talk over the business of the commune, replied the peasant, moving away. At that moment, on the road leading from the big house, two women and a man in a white hat were seen coming toward the officers. The one in pink is mine, so keep off, said Ilyin, on seeing Dunyasha running resolutely toward him. She'll be ours, said Lavrushka to Ilyin, winking. What do you want, my pretty? said Ilyin with a smile. The princess ordered me to ask your regiment in your name. This is Count Rostov, squadron commander, and I am your humble servant. Company! roared the drunk peasant with a beatific smile as he looked at Ilyin talking to the girl. Following Dunyasha, Alpatich advanced to Rostov, having bared his head while still at a distance. May I make bold to trouble your honor, he said respectfully, but with a shade of contempt for the youthfulness of this officer and with a hand thrust into his bosom. My mistress, daughter of the general-in-chief, Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky, who died on the 15th of this month, finding herself in difficulties owing to the boorishness of these people, he pointed then to the peasants, asks you to come up to the house. Won't you please ride on a little farther? 
said Alpatich with a melancholy smile. As it is not convenient in the presence of... He pointed to the two peasants who kept as close to him as horseflies to a horse. Ah, Alpatich! Ah, Yakov Alpatich! Grand! Forgive us for Christ's sake, said the peasant, smiling joyfully at him. Rostov looked at the drunk peasants and smiled. Or perhaps they amuse your honor, remarked Alpatich with a staid air, as he pointed to the old men with his free hand. No, there's not much to be amused at here, said Rostov, and rode on a little way. What's the matter? he asked. I make bold to inform your honor that the rude peasants here don't wish to let the mistress leave the estate and threaten to unharness her horses so that, though everything has been packed up since morning, her excellency cannot get away. Impossible! exclaimed Rostov. I have the honor to report you the actual truth, said Alpatich. Rostov dismounted, gave his horse to the orderly, and followed Alpatich to the house, questioning him as to the state of affairs. It appeared that the princess's offer of corn to the peasants the previous day, and her talk with Drawn at the meeting, had actually had so bad an effect that Drawn had finally given up the keys, and joined the peasants, and had not appeared when Alpatich sent for him. And in that morning, when the princess gave orders to harness for her journey, the peasants had come in a large crowd to the barn and sent word that they would not let her leave the village, that there was an order not to move, and that they would unharness the horses. Alpatich had gone out to admonish them, but was told, it was chiefly Carp who did the talking, drawn was not showing himself in the crowd, that they could not let the princess go, that there was an order to the contrary, but that if she stayed, they would serve her as before and obey her in everything. At the moment when Rostov and Ilyin were galloping along the road, Princess Mary, despite the dissuasions of Alpatich, her nurse, and the maids, had given orders to harness and attended to start, but when the cavalrymen were espied, they were taken for Frenchmen. The coachman ran away, and the woman in the house began to wail. "'Father, benefactor, God has sent you!' exclaimed deeply moved voices as Rostov passed through the anteroom. Princess Mary was sitting helpless and bewildered in the large sitting room when Rostov was shown in. She could not grasp who he was, and why he had come, or what was happening to her. When she saw his Russian face, and by his walk and his first words, he uttered, recognized him as a man of her own class. She glanced at him with her deep, radiant look, and began speaking in a voice that faltered and trembled with emotion. This meeting immediately struck Rostov as a romantic event. A helpless girl, overwhelmed with grief, left to the mercy of a coarse, rioting peasants. And what a strange fate! sent me here. Gentleness and nobility there are in her features and expression, thought he as he looked at her and listened to her timid story. When she began to tell him that all this had happened the day before, after her father's funeral, her voice trembled. She turned away, and then, as if fearing he might take her words as meant to move him to pity, looked at him with an apprehensive glance of inquiry. There were tears in Rostov's eyes. Princess Mary noticed this, and glanced gratefully at him, with that radiant look which caused the plainness of her face to be forgotten. I cannot express, Princess, how glad I am that I happen to ride here, and am able to show my readiness to serve you, said Rostov, rising. Go when you please, and I give you my word of honor that no one shall dare to cause you annoyance, if only you allow me to act as your escort. And bowing respectfully, as if to a lady of royal blood, he moved toward the door. Rostov's deferential tone seemed to indicate that though he would consider himself happy to be acquainted with her, he did not wish to take advantage of her misfortunes to intrude upon her. Princess Mary understood this and appreciated his delicacy. I am very grateful to you, she said in French, but I hope it was all a misunderstanding that no one is to blame for it. She suddenly began to cry. Excuse me, she said. Rostov, knitting his brows, left the room with another low bow. That concludes my reading of chapter 199. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 199 The Meat Cute, Tolstoy Style The Meat Cute is a storytelling trope where two characters destined for a romantic partnership first meet, often in a lightheartedly peculiar or humorous way. It's a staple of the screwball comedy genre. Think it happened one night, when Peter Warren, an impoverished reporter, and Ellie Andrews, a rich heiress, fight over the last bus seat. There's also that frivolous hopscotch scene in Hands Across the Table, or in The Lady Eve, 
when Jean Harrington, a gorgeous con artist, finds her mark in Charles Pike, the wealthy heir to a brewing company, tripping him up with her foot only to claim that he has broken her high-heeled shoe and must make good on it. Finally, think Kelly Kapoor and D'Angelo Vickers. In all these scenes, two characters meet by means of some comic, slap-happy contrivance, and then gay hijinks ensue. This is Tolstoy, though, so the future couple, Princess Mary and Nicholas Rostov, are introduced during a war, and then a dismal struggle against the incomprehensibly torturous web of a meaningless existence and the inevitable funeral march towards death ensues. Indeed, there are no comedic screwball shenanigans here. Princess Mary, all alone, is held hostage by a drunken cadre of peasants. Nicholas is a participant in a war that will eventually rob the lives of nearly 9 million military men. Around all of them, it seems, the old ways are crumbling or in some state of decay or destruction. Hashtag 19th century, y'all. Tears, so familiar to the characters of War and Peace, swell in the eyes of all today. And yet, amidst all this unhappiness, love blossoms. The two of them meet by chance during all of this madness, and, according to Rostov at least, the meeting is a meeting of romance. Why? given the horrors of their lives, not retreat into the safety of solitude instead. Why do these two, as the story progresses, pursue each other? Why, spoiler alert, do they eventually enter into marriage? Why would anyone? Daily Meditation Marriage is the highest state of friendship. If happy, it lessens our cares by dividing them at the same time that it doubles our pleasures by mutual participation. Samuel Richardson, Clarissa, or The History of a Young Lady. And that concludes my reading of and reflection on chapter 199 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation at PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. Tomorrow, we will be reading and reflecting on chapter 200 of War and Peace. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others. All right, big boy.